Hello and welcome to Chapter 2, Workforce Safety and Wellness of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, 12th edition. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand the importance of recognizing important hazards, coping with physical and mental stress, assisting patients and families with the emotional aspects of injuries, illness, and or death, taking appropriate preventative actions to ensure personal safety, dealing with patients and coworkers with sensitivity, taking proper precautions when dealing with infectious diseases, and preventing on-the-job injuries. Okay, so to take care of others, we must take care of ourselves. Recognition of hazards to your health, safety, and well-being is very important. This includes personal neglect, environmental and human-made threats, and mental and physical stress. The emotional well-being of an EMT and the patient are intertwined, especially in high-stress rescues. Health is a complex interaction between physical, mental, and emotional connections. Chronic physical, mental, or emotional stress can worsen or increase the chance for developing health conditions. Not all reactions, though, to stress are negative. So your stress, that creates a positive response. This is increased focus, increased energy in the short term, and increased job satisfaction and self-image in the long term. However, distress causes a negative stress response. Wellness is the active pursuit of a good state of health. Resilience is the capacity of an individual to cope with and recover from distress. The following practices can help increase resilience. You could eat healthy and um, maintain a well-balanced diet, ensure a minimum of seven to nine hours of sleep, strengthen positive relationships with close family and friends, build relationships with peers and colleagues, incorporate daily stretching, movement, and exercise, and build habits of mindfulness and positivity. You could, um, strategies to manage stress, you could minimize or eliminate stressors as much as possible. You could change partners to avoid a negative or hostile personality, change work hours, or change the work environment, and cut back on overtime, possibly. You could change your attitude about the stressor and talk about your feelings with people you trust. You could seek professional counseling if needed. Do not obsess over frustrating situations that are unable to change, such as relapsing alcoholics and nursing home transfers. Focus on delivering high quality care. Try and adopt a philosophical outlook. You could expand your social support system beyond your coworkers, develop friends and interests outside of emergency services, and you could limit the intake of caffeine, alcohol, and tobacco use. Okay, so a little bit about nutrition. You could eat regular, well-balanced meals and limit your consumption of sugar, fat, sodium, and alcohol. Complex carbohydrates are comparable to simple sugars in their ability to produce energy. So complex carbohydrates such as pasta, rice, and vegetables are among the most reliable sources for long-term energy production. Fats are easily converted to energy, but eating too much fat can lead to obesity, cardiac disease, and other long-term health problems. Maintain adequate fluid intake. Water is generally the best fuel available. Exercise and relaxation. So regular exercise will enhance the benefits of maintaining good nutrition and adequate hydration. When you are in good physical condition, you can handle stress more easily. Engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate or vigorous activity act at least five days per week. Include cardiovascular endurance, muscle strength building, and muscle flexibility. The National Sleep Foundation and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends that adults sleep in minimum of nine or seven to nine hours. Half of the EMS personnel gets less than six hours of sleep per 24 hours and report severe mental and physical fatigue. Short-term effects of sleep deprivation can lead to medical errors, vehicle crashes, and other harm to patients, bystanders, and other EMS providers. 
long-term effects of hypertension, sleep apnea, respiratory issues, diabetes, depression, and other medical conditions. Increased stress can contribute to sleep deprivation and fatigue issues. Evidence-based guidelines for fatigue management have been developed under the U.S. Department of Transportation and through the National Association of State EMS Officials. Fatigue sleeplessness should measure and monitor fatigue among EMS personnel. EMS personnel should work shifts shorter than 24 hours. EMS personnel should have access to caffeine to to shave off fatigue. EMS personnel should have the opportunity to nap while on duty to mitigate fatigue. EMS personnel should receive education and training to mitigate fatigue and fatigue-related risks. Recommendations to combat fatigue include getting an adequate duration of quality sleep and where allowed, take 20 to 30-minute naps or rest breaks during shift work. Increase physical activity, be careful about con- caffeine consumption, engage in mental exercise, such as having a conversation or playing a game. So we just talked about recommendations for combating fatigue. Now we're going to discuss recommendations to improve sleep quality. So you want to uh, avoid caffeine, nicotine, and other chemicals that interfere with sleep for at least four hours prior to bedtime. Ensure your sleep environment is dark, quiet, and cool. Exercise early, but with enough time to relax before you try and fall asleep. You want to nap early and avoid heavy pre-sleep meals and balance fluid intake. Establish a calming pre-sleep routine. Sleep when truly tired. Don't watch the clock and keep your sleep schedule as consistent as possible. When possible, expose yourself to natural light during your waking hours to maintain healthy sleep-wake cycles. We're going to talk about disease prevention and health promotion next. And so disease prevention focuses on medical care and prevention to avoid or reduce the effect of disease on the individual. Health promotion is focused on personal practices and social habits to improve one's health. Smoking, vaping, or chewing nicotine. So tobacco products can lead to cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Smokeless tobacco is associated with cancers of the throat, mouth, and pancreas. Vaping has been shown to cause cardiovascular and respiratory illness and disease. Strategies for quitting products containing nicotine include to create a plan that addresses the challenges that may trigger the use of these products. Set a quit date. Tell a friend, family, or coworker your plan to quit. Remove tobacco and vaping products from your home, car, or work, and talk to your doctor about the other resources that may have may be able to help you quit. Alcohol abuse. And so acceptable amount of alcohol um, is described to be one drink per day for women and two for men, according to the Centers for Disease Control and uh, uh, Prevention, the CDC. Excessive alcohol use causes about 88 thousand deaths per year in the United States with an economic cost of more than 200 billion per year. Approximately 75% of total cost of alcohol abuse is contributed to binge drinking. So excessive alcohol use may adversely affect the cardiovascular, hepatic, immune, and central nervous systems and may increase the risk of developing cancer of the mouth, throat, breast, esophagus, and liver. And then there's drug use. So both prescription medications and illegal or illicit drugs may be abused or misused. According to the CDC, drug abuse costs the United States more than $190 billion annually in lost work productivity, health care, and crime. Many EMS agencies drug test their, their employees for illegal and prescription drugs. Balancing work, family, and health. When possible, rotate your schedule to give yourself time off. You need to take vaccinations, and if at any point you feel stress of work is more than you can handle, seek help. Next, we're going to talk about infectious and communicable diseases. So an infectious disease is caused by organisms within the body, and a communicable disease can be spread. 
So a communicable disease can be spread from person to person or from one species to another. Infection is a risk. Infection risk can be minimized by immunizations, protective techniques, and hand washing. So next we're going to talk about some terminology that's related to the infectious and communicable diseases, okay? So a pathogen is the first thing we're going to talk about. And a pathogen is a microorganism that is capable of causing disease in the host. And then next is contamination. So the presence of an infectious organism or foreign body on or within objects such as dressings, water, food, or needles, wounds, or a patient's body. Exposure. So that's a situation in which a person has had contact with blood, body fluids, tissues, or airborne particles in a manner that may allow disease transmission to occur. Protective, personal protective equipment, or PPE, um, protects it's basically a protective equipment that an individual wears to prevent exposure to a pathogen or a hazardous material. So routes of transmission. The different routes of transmission in which an infectious disease can spread are direct contact, indirect contact, such as a needle stick, airborne transmission, like for example, sneezing, foodborne transmission, and that's contaminated food, and vector-borne transmission. An example of that would be flea or a mosquito. So risk reduction and prevention for infectious and communicable diseases. The Occupational Self and Health Administration, so OSHA, develops, publishes, and enforces guidelines concerning reducing hazards in the workplace. All EMTs are trained in handling blood-borne pathogens. The CDC has developed standard precautions for healthcare workers to use in preventing or in treating patients. Standard precautions are preventative measures designed to prevent healthcare workers from coming in contact with objects, blood, body fluids, and other potential risks that can lead to exposure of germs. The CDC recommends from 2016 uh, is to in, assume that every person is potentially infected or can spread an organism that can be transmitted in a healthcare setting. And so apply infection control procedures to reduce the infection. OSHA refers to the same concept as universal precautions. So you, you'll see that used interchangeably. Notify your designated officer if you were exposed. Donning and doffing full PPE. So putting on is donning and taking off is doffing. The full complement of PPE in a consistent sequence is essential to reduce the risk of contamination. The most common component of PPE are a mask, eyewear, or full face shield, gloves, and a gown. Proper hand washing, that's the simplest yet most effective way to control disease transmission. Wash hands before and after patient contact, even if you wear gloves. Okay, so gloves, very important subject. You're going to wear gloves if there's any possibility for exposure to blood or body fluids. So vinyl, nitrile, and latex gloves are effective protection. Wear heavy-duty gloves, so when cleaning the ambulance. Change gloves between patients. Removing gloves requires a technique to avoid contaminating yourself with the materials on the outside of the gloves. All right, so next we're going to talk about eye protection and face shields. So eye protection prevents or and protects from blood splatters and prescription glasses are not adequate. So goggles or a face shield are the best. And then there's gowns. So provide protection uh, for extensive blood splatter, and they may be worn in situations such as aerosolized um, generating procedures, field delivery of a baby, or some type of major trauma. Okay, next mask, and we're all very familiar with this. So mask, respiratory, respirators, and barrier devices. So wear a standard surgical mask for fluid spatter. 
place a surgical mask on a patient and a particulate air respirator, such as an N95 on yourself, if you suspect the patient has an airborne or droplet spread disease such as tuberculosis, influenza, or COVID-19. Protection, protective eyewear using safety glasses with side shields, goggles, or a full face shield is also needed. If the patient needs oxygen, place a non-rebreathing mask instead of a surgical mask on the patient and such set the air um, oxygen flow rate to 10 to 15 liters. Use of a particulate air respirator must comply with OSHA guidelines and must be fit tested to ensure their efficiency. Okay, so mouth to mouth or mouth to mask resuscitation is recommended in a situation where there is active community spread of an airborne virus. Bag valve ventilation is an aerosol generating procedure that should be avoided in um, epidemic scenarios such as COVID-19. So sharp stick, uh, sharp disposals, and so proper use of and proper disposal helps to avoid exposure uh, to HIV and hepatitis. Do not recap, break, or bed needles. Dispose of used sharps items in an approved closed and rigid container. So employer responsibilities. The risk of being exposed to a communicable disease is a hazard of the job. You should follow OSHA guidelines and other national guidelines and standards to reduce the risk of exposures to airborne pathogens and airborne diseases. Know your department's infection control plan and follow it. Cleaning and decontaminating the ambulance and equipment is important. You must clean the ambulance after each run and on a daily basis. Whenever possible, cleaning should be done at the hospital. There is more information about cleaning the ambulance in Chapter 38, Transport Operations. We're going to remove any medical waste, and it should be placed in a red biohazard bag and disposed of at the hospital. Contaminated equipment left at the hospital should be cleaned by hospital staff or placed in a red bag for transport and cleaning to the station. Use bleach water uh, solution at a dilution rate of one to 10 to clean the unit. Remove contaminated linen and place it in the appropriate bag for handling. Reusable equipment should be properly cleaned and sterilized per your department's standard operating procedure. And immunity. So even if germs reach you, you are not necessarily at risk for infection. Immunity is a major factor in determining which hosts become ill from which germs. You can be immune or resistant to particular germs. So the definition of immunity is having been immunized or vaccinated and able to recover from an infection uh, or from that germ. A history of all your childhood infectious diseases should be recorded and kept on file. This includes chicken pox, mumps, measles, rubella, and whooping cough. The CDC recommends the following immunizations for healthcare workers. Hepatitis B, that is required by OSHA. Influenza, that would be yearly. Measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR. Um, the Varsarella vaccine or having had chickenpox, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, which is the Tdap shot every 10 years. And skin tests for tuberculosis prior to hire and annually is recommended. General post-exposure management. So if you're exposed to a patient's blood or bodily fluids, you need to turn over patient care to another EMS provider. Clean the exposed area with soap and water and if it's in your eyes, if they were exposed, rinse your eyes for 20 minutes. Activate your department's infection control plan. You will have to complete an exposure report and be screened to determine whether there's a significant exposure to a bloodborne pathogen. If you were exposed to a highly communicable disease, such as COVID-19 without proper PPE, you may be required to quarantine for a predetermined period of time post-exposure prophylactis and treatment for significant exposure.
Okay, so now we're going to talk about scene safety. The personal safety of all those involved in an emergency situation is very important. And it begins with protecting yourself uh, as soon as you get dispatched. So you need to wear your seatbelt and don the appropriate PPE. Continue to protect yourself once on scene and make sure the scene is well marked. Place warning devices to alert other motorists on scene, park at a safe distance from the scene, and make sure there are plenty of light if it's dark. Also, wear reflective clothing if it is dark. Scene hazards. So, if you're looking at this slide, this is the 2020 Emergency Response Guidebook. And upon arrival, you need to look and treat, uh, or try and read the labels, placards, and identification numbers from the distance, perhaps with binoculars. A specially trained and equipped hazardous material team will be called to the scene to handle disposal of materials or removal of patients. Do not begin caring for the patients until they have been moved away from the scene and are deconned or the scene is safe for you to enter. Do not enter the scene unless it's safe to do so. The U.S. Department of Transportation ERG Emergency Response Guidebook lists common hazard materials and proper procedures for the scent control and emergency care of patients. Smartphone and tablet apps are also available. So there's general guidelines. Do not enter the scene if there is evidence of a hazmat. You need to remain upwind and uphill from that scene. Keep your distance and quickly contact dispatch and request additional responses. So do not enter the scene until instructed by trained hazardous material responders. Okay, so next scene hazard we're going to talk about is electricity. Dealing with down power lines is beyond the scope of EMT training. You need to mark off a danger zone around the down lines until the poles um, have been secured. And this safe, safety zone is one span of the power poles distance. Do not approach a downed wire or touch anything which downed with down wires are in contact with. So lightning is a threat in two ways. Um, it, you could be, it could be a threat because of a direct hit or a ground current. A repeat lightning strike in the same area can occur, so avoid high ground to minimize risk of a direct lightning strike. To avoid being injured by the ground current, stay away from drainage ditches, moist areas, small depressions, and wet ropes. When lightning is nearby, make sure the smallest target possible that you become and drop all equipment. Okay, the next hazard, scene hazard we're going to talk about is fire, and common hazards include smoke, oxygen deficiency, high temperatures, toxic gases, there could be a building collapse because of the fire, uh, equipment or explosions. Next is vehicle crashes. So at vehicle crashes, they are common events, and vehicle collisions Hazards include traffic, unstable vehicles, down power lines, risk of violence, airbags, and fluid um, and sharp objects. So use sufficient proper protective gear to reduce the risk. And then there's violence on scenes. And this includes assaults, hostile situations, riots, or other disturbances. And um, a scene assessment should begin while you are en route. And once on scene, continue your assessment using personal observation and information from other responders while maintaining personal safety and the safety of your team. Okay, and then another scene type of violence could be mass violence. And with mass violence, several agencies may be involved. So you need to know who is in command. You also have to remain vigilant for potential for violence at all times. Allow law enforcement to secure the scene before you approach. At scenes in involving projectiles, find protection. So two types of protection. There's one, it's called cover, and that's the tactile uh, use of some type of impenetrable barriers for protection. Then there's concealment. And concealment is uh, hiding behind objects to limit the person's ability to see you. 
If you believe the event is a crime scene, uh, attempt to maintain the chain of evidence and do not disturb the scene unless it is absolutely necessary for patient treatment. Violence against responders. So, the rate of violence-related injuries with work loss uh, for emergency responders is 22 times higher than the overall rate for other employees in the United States. Recommendations for prevention of violence. So training and practice in, in identifying scenes of potential violence. You need to get training and practice in de-escalation strategies and techniques. Practice in ongoing scene assessments and dispatch identification and alerting of past or potential threats of violence. Recommendations for protection against violence include training and practice in self-defense and escape techniques, training and practice in physical and chemical restraint techniques, fitting and use of body armor, and training and practice in operations with law enforcement. Protective clothing. Wearing protective clothing and other appropriate gear is critical to personal safety. Become familiar with the protective equipment available to you. Inspect your clothing and wear your gear regularly, ideally before you reach the scene. Types of protective clothing include cold weather gear, and that usually consists of three layers. So the first one's a thin inner layer, and that pulls moisture away from the skin. Then there's a thermal middle layer that serves as ice insulation. And then finally, an outer layer that resists wind, rain, sleet, or snow. Then uh, the, another type of protective clothing is turnout gear. And this protects the firefighters from heat, fire, sparks, and flashover. It's also called bunker gear. Okay, and then you have gloves. They protect from heat, cold, and cuts. They also may, may reduce dexterity in a rescue situation. And then helmets. It should be worn anytime you're working in a fall zone. Helmets should provide top and side protection as well as secure chin strap. Construction types helmets are not well suited for rescue situations. A helmet with a chin strap and face shield should always be worn in situations involving electrical hazards. And then there's boots. These should be water resistant, fit well, and be flexible. Steel toed boots are preferred, and traction is important for rescue situations. Eye protection includes eyeglasses with side shields during routine patient care, and when tools are in use, use a face shield and goggles. Then there's ear protection, and this could be soft foam industrial type earplugs. Skin protection is important, so pr this protects against sunburn during outside work. Also, use of sunscreen with a minimum of 15 SPF. And th then there's body armor, and this includes bulletproof vests, and it ranges from light, weight, and flexible to heavy and bulky. Um, vests may be practical, uh, they may not be practical for everyday use. They are costly and do not protect against rifle ammunition or stabbing attacks. So long, loose hair, rings, and jewelry. Many EMS services have restricted policies regarding hair, rings, and jewelry. Uh, you should tie hair up neatly, limit the number of rings worn, and wear only a watch on your wrist. Okay, so the next section we're going to start talking about is caring for critically ill and injured patients. And so a patient needs to know who you are and what you're doing. So let the patient know that you're attending um, to his or her immediate needs. Avoid making unprofessional com comments during resuscitation and treat all patients with dignity and respect. Techniques for communicating with critical patients include avoid sad and grim comments. And these remarks about a patient's condition may increase the patient's anxiety. Orient the patient. So use brief statements. Orient the patient to his or her surroundings. You need to be honest. So decide how much information your patient can understand and accept. Allow the patient to be part of the care being given. Also allow for hope. If there's the slightest chance of hope relating, transmit that message to the patient. 
and locate and notify family members. So assure the patient that you are, uh, that you will take care of notifying the appropriate people. Critically uh, injured children. So children should be cared for as any adult would be. It's important that you, that a relative or responsible adult accompany the child to relieve anxiety and assist in care as appropriate. So coping with the death of a child. The death of a child is a tragic and dreaded event. Help the family through the initial period of death. And you're going to be helping family members. So acknowledge death in a private place. Shock, denial, and disbelief are common emotions. If circumstances allow, let the parents hold the child. Use your best judgment to determine if this is appropriate. Let the family's actions be your guide. The family may want to see the child, and you should allow them to do so. So prepare the parents for what they will see. Do not overload the grieving parents with information. Okay, so death and dying. So death is likely to be either quite sudden or after a prolonged terminal illness. The EMT will sometimes face death. The grieving process um, has stages. In the first stages, it could be denial, um, anger, hostility, bargaining, depression, or acceptance. So what can the EMT do? You can ask the patient and family if there is anything you could do to help. Reinforce the reality of the situation. You need to be honest with the death and dying. Do not say you know how the patient or family feels. Let the patient or family members grieve in their own way. So this table shows a slide suggesting words of comfort when responding to grief. All right, so next we're going to talk about some stress management. And, of course, you probably have suspected that EMS is a high-stress job. It's important to know the causes of stress and ways to deal with them. So stressors, they include emotional, physical, and environmental situations. There are general adap adaption syndromes. And so alarm response to stress then the reaction and resistance to stress, and then there's recovery or exhaustion from that stress. Physiological manifestations of stress. So that it creates an increased respirations and heart rate, increased blood vessels, dilated vessels near the skin surface, dilated pupils, tense muscles, increased blood glucose levels and perspiration. It also decreases blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract. Situations that are stressful for EMS providers include the following. So you could be in a dangerous situation, physical or psychological demands, critically ill or injured patients, dead or dying patients, or overpowering sight, smells, and sounds multiple patient situations, angry or upset patients, families or bystanders, and unpredictability and demands of EMS cause stressful situations. There are stress reactions. So there is an acute reaction, and that can occur during that event. There's a delayed reaction, and that manifests after the stressful event. And then there's a cumulative stress. And that's a prolonged or excessive stress. So there's physical symptoms of stress, and that could include fatigue, changes in appetite, GI problems, headaches, insomnia, irritability, inability to concentrate, or hyperactivity or underactivity. There's physiological symptoms, and that could be fear, a dull or non-responsive behavior, depression, guilt, or oversensitivity, anger, Ill irritability, or and frustration. Critical incident stress is brought about by acute severe stressors. These could include mass casualty incidents, serious injury or, or traumatic death of a child, crashes with injuries caused by an emergency provider while traveling to or from a call, and death or serious injury of a co-worker in the line of duty. 
they may develop after a person has experienced a physiological distressing event. And so this is post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's characterized by re-experiencing the event and over-responding to stimuli that you recall from that event. Critical Instant Stress Management, or also called CISM, is used to help providers relieve stress. And this can occur formally or at an ongoing scene. Trained CISM professionals facilitate, they facilitate diffusing sessions and they're held during or immediately after the event. Also debriefing, and those sessions are held 24 to 72 hours after the event. An important rule is not to turn the debriefing session into an operational critique. If CISM or uh, critical instant stress management is not an option, private counseling by a mental health professional may be preferred. Then there's burnout. So burnout describes a combination of exhaustion, cynicism, and related performance resulting from long-term job stress. The effects of well-being of an EMT along with that of his or her colleagues and patients can result in an increased major medical errors, increased rates of health care associated infection, and increased patient mortality. Also contributes to decreases in work morale, overall work effort, effective teamwork, patient satisfaction, and an increase in job turnover. Then there's a thing called compassion fatigue. And what happens, it's common among healthcare providers. It's also known as a secondary stress disorder. It's characterized by gradual lessening of compassion over time. The symptoms are high absenteeism, difficult relationships with colleagues and coworkers, inability to work in teams, aggressive behavior towards patients, strong negative attitudes towards work, lack of empathy for patients, judgmental attitude towards patients, preoccupation with non-work issues while on duty, and other symptoms of increased stress. Responder risk for suicide. So the, re the suicide rate among emergency responders is higher than that of the rest of the population. Job stress is widely considered to be the largest contributing factor to suicide. Several organizations and mental health services are available to provide emotional support. Emotional aspects of emergency care. So at times, even the most experienced healthcare provider has difficulty overcoming personal reactions and proceeding without hesitation. The struggle to remain calm in the face of horrible circumstances contributes to the emotional stress of the job. Stressful situations, you must exercise extreme professional care in both your words and your actions on scene. Factors that influence how a patient reacts to stress of an EMS incident include a social economic background, fear of medical personnel, alcohol or substance abuse disorders, history of chronic stress, mental disorders, reaction to medication, age, nutritional status, feelings of guilt, past experiences with illness or injury. So quickly and calmly assess the actions of the patient, family members, and bystanders. Use a professional tone and show courtesy, along with a sincere concern and efficient action. Patients must be given the opportunity to express their fears and concerns. Religious customs or needs of the patient must be respected. So some people might have religious convictions that strongly oppose the use of medications, blood, and blood products. Report this information to the next level of care. In the event of death, handle the body with respect and dignity. Next, we're going to talk about workplace issues. So contra uh, cultural diversity on the job. You're expected to work alongside coworkers with varying backgrounds, attitudes, beliefs, and values, and to accept their differences. Culture is not restricted to different nationalities. You should also consider age, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, work experience, and education. 
communicate in a way that is sensitive to everyone's need. Your ultimate goal should be to uh, cultural humility, remain curious about others, and consistently reflect on their viewpoints with an open mind. There's two types of sexual harassment we're going to talk about next, and there is the quid pro quo. That's when the harasser requests sexual favors in exchange for something else, such as a promotion. Then the next type of harassment is going to be hostile working environment. This could be just jokes, touching, uh, requesting a date, or t uh, talking about body parts. The intent of the harasser does not matter, but rather the perception of the act and the impact of the behavior on someone else. Because EMTs and other public safety professionals depend on one another for their safety, it is especially important for you to develop non-adversarial relationships with coworkers. Report harassment to your supervisor immediately. Next, we're going to talk about a workplace issue, which is substance abuse. And this increases risk of accidents and tension. It causes poor treatment decisions. Many EMS systems now require personnel to undergo periodic random tests for illegal drugs and have for cause testing when it is believed that the individuals are under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Addicts and alcoholics develop great skills at covering their behavior. Seek help or find a way to confer, uh, conf confront an addicted coworker. Allowing substance abuse to go on presents a tremendous hazard to the public. Employee assistance of programs, which is EAPs, are often available. Next workplace issue is injury and illness prevention. So EMS providers visit emergency departments for work-related injuries and exposures over 20,000 times each year. Each program should include interrelated and interdependent elements. And this is management, leadership, worker prevention, hazard identification and assessment, hazard prevention and control, education and training, and program evaluation and improvement. Okay, so now we are at the review um, questions for the chapter, and uh, I'm just going to go through them with you. So um, the first one, number one, is a disease that can spread from person to person is known as? Okay, so communicable disease. This can spread from one person or a species to another. The most effective way of preventing the spread of disease is? Very simply, we're living through it right now, and it should be hand washing. So according to the CDC, the most effective way of preventing the spread is through hand washing. And two, while caring for a trauma patient, the EMT has blood splash into their eyes. This is an example of an example of an exposure. So an exposure occurs when a person comes in contact, direct or indirect contact with blood or other body fluids. Protective measures that prevent healthcare workers from coming into contact with germs are referred to as, you should know this, it's going to be standard precautions. So this prevents healthcare workers from coming into contact with germs. When is the second stage of response in the stress response known as the general adaption syndrome? Or what is, sorry, what is the second stage of response? And that is the body typically reacts to stress in three stages. There's the alarm response, then there's the reaction, and then there's the resistance, then the recovery. Okay, so a condition characterized by re-experiencing an event and over-responding to that stimuli that uh, they recall is called, and we should, you should know that that is a post-traumatic stress disorder. So PTSD, it may develop after a person has experienced that distressing event. Okay, blank is the fuel to make the body run. 
and that is the uh, nutritious food. I would have said sleep, <laughs> but the physical exertion and stress, they require high energy output. So C, so food, food. Which, den, which stage of grieving commonly results in blame? And that is going to be B. So the person may lash out at the EMT or blame the EMT for the unfortunate event. So it's going to be anger and hostility. Okay, now number nine, placards are used on. And uh, this is the one about um, the transport. So the placards are used on buildings and transport vehicles. And it shows you right there. So buildings, transport vehicles. Okay, the five most common hazards associated with a structural fire include, all right, so oxygen deficiency. We know smoke. There are a lot of temperatures, gases, and building collapse. I think it's A. All right, so that's the five. So it's structural fire is smoke, oxygen deficiency, high temperatures, toxic gas, and building collapse risk. Okay. And thank you very much for joining us for chapter two. Um, hope you have a good night.